So hello friends, so I'll be giving an overview on this uh, debate that I had in uh, World ERDS Day. So the debate was lumpers and splitters, uh, would they influence the outcome? So I was meant to speak on pro. So basically saying lumpers and splitters both are needed. So basically the, uh, the meaning of this is we need both uh, that we put, we look at ARDS as a whole and then we also need to look at to the phenotypes. So my opponent was Dr. Sharmini. So who would say that these differentiators are not needed? So my argument is these differentiators are needed in ARDS. So I would talk as to the advantage of looking at it as a whole. Then I would also talk on limitations of ARDS just for the benefit of all our listeners. Then we would try to understand and summarily that both are needed. Lumpers also are needed, splitters also are needed, but there are limitations of splitters. So this is what I would look at it. So why we need to look at ARDS as a whole? So it has been 57 years and we have been grappling to define what ARDS is and the definition has been fluidic over last 57 years. So the first definition came in 1967 by Ashbog et al. In 1988, they revisited this topic and they came out with a lung injury score to identify and collate this condition of ERDS. And in 1992, they again redefined it and all these definitions are covered in a separate topic on newer definition of ERDS. So there was a consensus statement. So if you look into the previous video, you would have the differentiators as to what the definitions of each different uh, era was. So consensus statement was made by US and Europe group in 1992 and they altered the definition of lung injury score and came out with a new definition. And until now, what we have been essentially been following is this was remodified by Berlin definition in 2012 by ARDS definition task force. And that is what we have largely adopted as of now. And we have been following PF less than 300, less than 200, less than 100, so on and so forth. So this is the definition. And now in 2024, there is a new global definition. So what does this mean, friends? So from last 57 years, we are grappling with simple definition of ERDS. And it has been so uh, fluidic in nature with regards to the way that we identify. The only simple reason, I'll tell you the simple reason why this new global definition has come in essence is to try and incorporate large group of patients to make a good study and try to understand the specific treatments which can influence good outcomes. So that is the essence because if you look at any big ARDS study, the numbers were not very huge. So you wouldn't have a ARDS study with 10,000 patients, 15,000 patients. You would have just with three number digits, maybe 250 patients, max 278, 280, less than 300. So you wouldn't have a big group of patients because it's hard to if you make the definition very stringent, you would get very less number. So the global definition, as I have understood, is with an intent to include large group of patients so that better stratification of the patients can be done, better treatment options can be different. So we need, so this is where lumping, lumping was needed for global definition, but splitting is needed to try and ascertain what treatment will influence outcomes in spe specific subgroup of patients. So that is our current sort of a summarily understanding of this particular topic. So when you look at ARDS largely, so obviously they have divided into the clinical understanding of ARDS and physiological basis of ARDS and biological basis. All this is with an intent that a precise therapeutic sort of a options can be derived uh, with an intent to target effectively and influence good outcome. So when we talk about phenotyping, when I say phenotyping, it is splitters. So why we phenotype is try to understand various sort of a spectrum of ARDS because we understand it's a hugely heterogeneous disease. But there are seven limitations of phenotyping because all the phenotyping has come from retrospective cohort studies. Even the Berlin definition, if you see, they've taken a large retrospective data and tried to identify the groups which you call as ARDS and including the current global definition. So there is no prospective validation when you are determining the phenotype. 
And once you have determined phenotype, there is a gross instability and there is a risk of misclassification in phenotypes. Because now phenotypes, you have P1, P2, hyperinflammatory, hypoinflammatory. What you may have called hyperinflammatory after a few days may become hypoinflammatory. So, and the way you have determined that hyperinflammatory and hypoinflammatory also may be quite fluidic in nature and there can be divergence. So, there is some possibility of this misclassification. And it is hard to apply this principle at the bedside to say this is hyperinflammatory ADS, this is hypoinflammatory ADS, and this is a trait of ARDS which do, do not possibly have a survival. And this is a type of ARDS where biomarker are telling us that this is a hyperinflammatory, so on and so forth. So uh, applicability at the bedside appears to be poor at this point of time. And we have still not understood the uh, variance in the pathobiology of different phenotypes of ARDS. And the most importantly, the when you ha having identified phenotype P1, P2, P3, or even up to 30 types of traits of ARDS that you may have identified, uh, even if you target differential treatment to different phenotypes, we do not know whether that has changed the outcome. So there's no evidence to suggest that I target P1 with this treatment, I target P2 with this treatment, and these differential treatments has led to favorable outcomes in these two has not been ascertained. There is no evidence at this point of time to ascertain that a specific treatment uh, targeting to hypoinflammatory has led to good outcome. Specific treatment targeted to hyperinflammatory has led to better outcomes. So we don't have data for that. And all the trials, as I've already mentioned, are of small size. So you cannot uh, sub-fragment it and then derive any sort of a logical conclusion. So the trial design complexities remain. And premature implementation of this substratification leads to a lot of risk. And this, where did we see, friends? So uh, premature implementation of subgroups we saw during COVID. We defined the ARDS as H-type, L-type. And later we realized all that was rubbish. Because it was H-type, uh, we de deprived certain patients of NIV. And possibly they all died because they were the... So then later we realized nothing of this exists and they did benefit from NIV, steroids, so on and so forth. So premature implementation can lead to risk, which can lead to detrimental outcomes. So these are seven limitations of phenotyping of ERDS. And when we say prospective validation, all the phenotyping has happened from the retrospective analysis. This hyperinflammatory phenotype, hypoinflammatory uh, phenotype, all this has come from retrospective post hoc data and real time prospective randomized control trials are very scarce. And because there is no RCTs to identify phenotypes, uh, to adopt this as a standard clinical tool is superfluous at this point of time. And we did talk about instability and misclassification. See, when the patient, when it comes to ER, your SpO2 by FiO2 may be low, but give little oxygen, it may have changed from one phenotype to another phenotype after initial resuscitation. So that also, there, so there is a sort of a uh, dynamic change in the way the ARDS progresses. So what you may have identified one at the outset, not necessarily after a few hours, it may remain in that subcategory. So that, so it keeps fluctuating. So the disease itself may keep changing from either mild to moderate and moderate to severe, or it may be, it, it may appear as severe and then suddenly become mild after some time with institution of certain resuscitative measures, so on and so forth. So, so there is some sort of a fluidity in the way disease progresses and it is hard to put them into two baskets and say this is this phenotype and it is that phenotype. And as I've already mentioned, there are no bedside tools available. Uh, there's no real-time bedside tool to say this is this phenotype, this is that phenotype. And there are no rapid tests that are available and these tests may not be accessible to say these are the phenotypes. And if you look at the biomarker-based strategy, some of them may have sophisticated assets like checking interleukin levels or checking surfactant levels, so on and so forth. Plus, machine learning algorithms are currently unavailable to say which phenotype our ARDS belongs to. And pathobiology, the whole pathobiology of different phenotypes of ARDS itself is poorly understood. And we do not know whether phenotypic specific treatments are available and whether those treatments influence outcome is elusive, which we have already spoken about. And we do not know the phenotypes that we have differentiated, whether they represent any unique ARDS traits is something that we aren't sure. 
And I already mentioned that the differential response, secondary analysis shows that the differential response to different phenotypes are fairly heterogeneous and inconsistent. And as of now, the studies which has compared standard versus phenotype treatment, so treatment that are instituted for standard ARDS versus phenotypic treatment has at this point of time, although it is small subgroup studies, they have not shown any difference. So you said P1, I treat this way, it will have a different outcome. P2, I treat this way, it will have a different outcome. So this comparison with the uh, holistically looking at ARDS as one and treating, these two groups have not shown any difference as of now. So we do not know. Identifying phenotype is for what benefit, we aren't sure at this point of time. And trial designs are theoretically promising. But as I said, the ARDS number itself is small. If you keep fragmenting them, uh, the numbers become too small to generalize this to a larger group of patients and considering that as a standard of care. So these are some of the limitations of uh, phenotyping or splitting, splitting ARDS. So, so this first argument what I'm making uh, literally tells you that we need to have lumping of ARDS so that we group them as one big, so that we include large group of patients as a first step and then do the good studies, look at the clinical outcomes, make observations, and then possibly splitting to calibrate our treatment may be more beneficial is the way to go. And as I've already said, premature implementation happened in COVID, where we differentiated ARDS between L-type and H-type. L-type had low elastance, high compliance. H-type had high elastance and low compliance. And even to a point in COVID, we said L-type, we should use higher tidal volume and H-type, we should use lower tidal. So all this was rubbish. Later, we felt ARDS is ARDS. There's no L-type or H-type. So, and this was fallacious and fugacious. So this is the problem with premature implementation of ARDS. And now if you look at the global definition, there are three unique characteristics they have included, which the whole intent appears that they would want to incorporate large cohort of patients to do clinical studies to see whether we can have better answers of customizing or calibrating the treatment. What are the three differences that they took? Before they had said there should be an acute trigger. The newer definition says there can be a background chronic disease. On that, an acute trigger can happen. You can still cause, call it as ARDS. The second important thing they utilize is even if you do not have CT chest or X-ray, so you could use ultrasound to categorize it as ARDS. And the third thing they said, before we said, if it is cardiogenic pulmonary edema, we said that it rules out ARDS. But now the global definition says they can have cardiogenic pulmonary edema. On top of it, they can have ARDS component, and which we are seeing. We see influenza patients where they may have underlying lung pathology, ground glass opacities with inflammatory changes in the lung. Along with it, we'll have a lot of B lines. So there is both coexistence. Both coexistence have been incorporated. So the intent is to incorporate large group of patients, categorize them as ARDS is the way to go. And the, the from the therapeutic standpoint, uh, patients don't need to be intubated. Earlier, patient had to be intubated to say ARDS. Now, the newer uh, sort of a categorization is that even before it used to be only PF ratio, you needed to have ABT. Now, they have taken saturation by oxygen ratio also. Uh, uh, which we can be utilized to determine if someone has ARDS. And now you don't need to be intubated with PEEP or NIV with PEEP. Even patients who are on HFNO also can be categorized as ARDS. So what do you make out? The common sense tells that you have included five new elements in including ARDS. So one is acute trigger is not needed. And second is you can use ultrasound. Heart failure can be present. A patient need not be intubated. You don't need PAO2. Saturations can be taken. And patients on HFN also can be included in ARDS. So you have taken basically five elements, additional five elements to categorize them as ARDS. The intent is you are lumping them and trying to include more number of patients so that we have better answers in determining treatment. So my argument is lumping is needed to include large. But splitting also is needed. So the my rebuttal, obviously, although I'm doing it as a rebuttal, but we need both lumping and splitting. Why we need splitting? Because see this train, this has come from the ARDS authors only. The train is a whole, you can't look at train and say all the compartments are the same. Compartments are different. So this is how ARDS is. But you have to address the train, moves into one direction, but you have to address compartments because 
you have to treat the etiological factor because whether you have to ascertain whether it's primary RDS or secondary RDS and treat the underlying cause because the underlying cause here, it can be trauma, it can be burns, it can be transfusion, it could be aspiration. So you may have to treat that in secondary RDS to influence outcome. And splitting is needed to determine which are the patients who benefit from proning. You don't need to, once you say RDS, it doesn't mean everyone needs proning. So there has to be substratification to determine who benefits from proning. And even PEEP optimization uh, for severe ARDS, obviously PEEP optimization becomes a lot more critical in influencing outcome. And there are subgroup of patients who use who may need neuromuscular blockers. Not all ARDS needs neuromuscular blockers. And biomarkers are becoming important to determine whether there is a systemic problem or whether the problem is limited to the only lung because it, studies have shown if there is a systemic problem, suppose there is an ARDS with very high lactate, where hyper, there is a cardiac component, there is a hypoperfusion, they have a worse outcome. And you have to relate to SOFA score to see the prognostication of ARDS if other organs are involved. And biomarkers to some effect can be may be needed to determine whether other organs. So you have to look whether it's only primary lung involvement or ARDS is a part of other systemic global problem because they have a bearing on influencing the prognostication. And phenotypic or splitting or stratification is needed to at least identify patients who are resistive to conventional treatment and to determine the goals because the goals for mild ARDS may be different. Goals for moderate ARDS may be different. Goals for severe ARDS are different. And in some of the ARDS, you may have to have aggressive, innovative treatment and determine which are the patients who are excluded from the trials. And we may have subgroup of patients who may do well with NIV and there are subgroup of patients who need early intubation. And there are group of patients who need a very uh, judicious and regimental sort of a fluid balance to be maintained. So, and, and we may need a subgroup of patients where we have to not only look at short-term outcome, even long-term outcome may have to be looked at. And you may have to look at, uh, uh, you know, the patients who may be excluded from looking at this outcome. So, so basically, there are a lot of different dimensions uh, which need to be ascertained for which you may have to substratify to ascertain the prognostic value, certain therapeutic interventions that you may have to uh, calibrate to the need of the hover. And you have to look at whether it's a only isolated lung problem or there is a multi-organ involvement for that biomarkers may be needed. So, so my conclusion is we have to be lumpers to include large group of patients and categorize them as ARDS. Then we need splitting to ascertain the calibration of treatment that may be needed with the specific goals for different uh, subgroups of the patients. So both are needed would be my argument. So I would say, although I would look at elephant as a whole, because I would look at as a lumper, to include large group of patients and say these are ARDS, and then I would want to split them. Although Sharmili would say splitting is useless, but I would say splitting is needed uh, to uh, try to calibrate our treatment and help us prognosticate at this point of time. So this, was, so this was the sort of a discussions that evolved uh, when I did this debate. Uh, so I hope this is be useful. So the take home message is we need both lumping and we need splitting uh, because both are needed to uh, try and manage this ARDS more effectively to influence the outcome. Thank you, friends. Request you all to submit your work uh, to General of Acute Care because you can visit my website to rehab this lecture. So thank you. Thank you, Vandor.